All right, I am here with Elias Shivando, and he is the president and CEO of Uver. How's it going, Elias? It is going great, Steve. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. And I'm really excited to unpack your successes. But before we get there, let's talk about your background. What got you into business and entrepreneurship? Um, you know, I, I started my career as, a, uh, as an entrepreneur, um, selling candy in Mexico and, um, and just buying and selling stuff. Uh, it's always intrigued me. I'm not a good corporate, uh, <laughs> a, a, a corporate person. So I've also, I'll also venture in corporate for many years. I was director of the West region of autotrader.com and also in charge of sales and marketing. Um, struggled tremendously with the committees and, and meetings and meetings after meetings in, 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 in the corporate world. And, um, and programmers telling me that things could not be done. That was my biggest struggle. So I started learning to code so I could tell them how to do it or answer their questions or refute their questions, basically, or their, their, their objections. Um, I was entrepreneur in residence for JP Morgan for a couple of years. Um, and I also have been in the classified ads world and the automotive world for, for many years, uh, initially as a marketing manager for a classified newspaper in Los Angeles. And uh, I have consulted to about 73 marketplaces around the world, including Craigslist and eBay and um, and the big ones in, in Europe, Ross Media and uh, eBay Motors and, and several other ones. So, nice. you know, that's in a nutshell. Nice. And for everybody listening, there is a like a situation that I went through, I know a lot of people that have gone through where you have to come to terms with the identity of entrepreneurship, where you, you can't fit in to a corporation and a large company. And it's very difficult at first. You're like, wait, what's wrong? Why can't I fit into this? And, and you get pushed as to an, an outsider. And it's such a difficult thing for, especially young, young entrepreneurs, just figuring out that they don't really fit that mold and they need to do something on their own. And it is a, a real crazy identity situation that everybody goes through. And if you're listening to this, you're going through it, just know that it's, it's normal. <laughs> it's normal to know that you can identify with entrepreneurship and be a zero to one founder and it's okay. It's totally cool uh, to, to do that. And I'm glad that you touched on that because it is, it's a huge topic that a lot of people talk about of, you know, going through college or something and figuring out that they can't take a certain position because they're just uncomfortable. And, um, it, it's, it's a real unique topic for sure. Yeah. And it has to do with productivity. I, I have seen also of, on the flip side, people that have spent 20, 30 years in corporate or maybe less than uh, 10 years in, in large corporation, and they try to start a business and they just, struggle with the the fact that you actually have to produce you know if you mm. don't produce you don't make money as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. um don't get me wrong getting a paycheck every two weeks is fantastic mm -hmm. um <laughs> you know i do miss that part <laughs> but uh but the frustration and the um and the struggles of uh just being exactly your identity of um it, it is very hard to be in, in corporate and it's different personalities nothing wrong with either one of them that's right. Um, you know, you are, and what I tell people is you are a salesperson, no matter what you're incorporated, you're an entrepreneur, you are always selling. Um, I remember one, uh, client of mine on the coaching side, he said, well, but I want to be a doctor. Why, why would I want to be a salesperson? I said, well, convince me that I need a surgery, you know, convince yeah. me that you are the best doctor in town and yeah. I shouldn't get a second opinion. I said, well, that's not sales. I said, well, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it right. is as simple as that. But uh, yeah, I mean, no matter what you go in corporate or entrepreneurship, the sales aspect has to be there on entrepreneurship is if you don't sell, you don't eat on the corporate, you know, it depends. Well said learning how to sell yourself even um, just in it general is. is huge. So let's yeah. talk about the first success. Like let, let's talk about the, the first company that you started seeing you know, some traction and started growing. So, um, back in the nineties, uh, we started a consulting firm. There was a whole, the first, uh, 
free trade agreement between Mexico and the U.S. Uh, the first before NAFTA, they they started doing a free trade agreement, and uh, companies in Mexico, manufacturers and and people that wanted to sell into the U.S. were asked to comply with certain quality standards, like the ISO 9000 and just the quality standards of the that the U.S. demanded. So when I was 22 years old, I started a consulting firm to teach people in Mexico how to, what quality was, what quality meant, what uh, General MacArthur te teach the, the Japanese in after the Second War, you know, how, what quality management was and, and what have you, and became very successful. Um, we used to do seminars, two or 300 people uh, throughout Latin America, mostly Mexico, and then, and then clients that would ask us to go and tell them how to become ISO 9000 certified or just implement quality standards in, in Latin America. We sold that to a, a large conglomerate in Venezuela. Of course, that was before the Venezuela went south, but uh, that was fun. Yeah. And what types of things were you guys measuring, like KPIs to define success at the company? Was it the amount of revenue? Was it the amount of people that went through that? ISO process or how are you defining success? It was very young and very inexperienced. So we were just measure, me, measuring success the old fashioned way, right? Uh, we spent this much money um, promoting the seminar. We got, uh, this were our expenses and this is how much money we made. This is a profit. Um, you know, our, our whole concentration was to make every single event, every single consulting um, job uh, profitable. Mm -hmm. So it was, I learned there back then, Steve, that uh, it's all about profit, right? Uh, all the numbers, all the metrics, all the data that you can possibly imagine at the end of the day is how much money did you make per sale? Mm -hmm. And yeah. and today, I mean, I, I, sorry to, to go a little bit in, in a different direction, but today it applies. We're living in a phenomenon where companies and entrepreneurs are eager to sell a bunch of products online on Amazon or, or what have you. And they do. I mean, it's pretty easy to sell. It's pretty easy to increase your sales if you increase your advertising budget, but it's very difficult to quantify the profits. And we're living in a, a phenomenon that will crash pretty soon and it's crashing um, on e-commerce, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you see all these consultants telling you, you know, hire me and I'll tell you how to increase your sales. Well, that is very, very easy to increase your sales, but it comes at a cost. Yeah. And, um, and I learned that um, very, very early. Yeah. So let, let's talk a little bit more about, uh, about Reagan. And mm. this was, this was after the consulting company or was that classified as the way after the consulting company? Way after. When, okay. Yeah. When I left out of trade.com or they left me, um, one of my ex neighbors, uh, Michael Reagan, the adopted, adopted son of president Ronald Reagan, you know, for, for many years kept telling me, look, I have this domain name called Reagan.com. I don't know what to do. I, I mean, I have a website and I'm not making any money with it. So I came up with this, the stupidest idea I've ever had. I said, Michael, why don't we sell email addresses? I said, what are you talking about? Of course, Michael is not the sharpest tool in the, in the world. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he just happened to be adopted by a very prominent family. But um, so there's no gene transfer there or anything like that. And, um, and I said, listen, you know, you can have your email address, Steve at Reagan.com for $40 a year and people will pay for it. He says, no, nobody's going to pay for it. I have AOL and it's free. I said, okay, fine. Let's just try it. You know, it will cost me $6,000. I'll write the code. We'll launch it. Uh, you can call one of your buddies at Fox News and see if they interview you and you talk about it. And, um, and we'll see what happens. And <laughs> I did. It took me three months to write the code, uh, get it tested. Um find a place where the server was going to be located so the Patriot Act would not apply. Um, so nobody, you know, the government could not come and say, hey, give me Steve's emails. You know, yeah, yeah. I want the data. So we, we found that. So it took me three months. We launched. Michael Reagan went on the air with uh, Hannity. Um, and we sold 7,000 emails in about half an hour. Wow. It was an incredible boost. And, and then we kept selling, 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 selling. 18 months later, I, a very wealthy individual from Chicago came and, and bought the company at a $23 million valuation. So that was a fun ride. It was an incredible ride. The problem came, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> great idea, great company, great software, great um, uh, sale of the company, bad people. I was associated with um, 
people with no stand, no ethical, moral, or any standards whatsoever. Mm. Uh, this guy, Michael Reagan, you know, lived his life in a uh, very privileged life. And, you know, he never had to work. Um, basically, daddy would give him, you know, jobs to, you know, to make a living. And when the money came and when he saw, um, you know, what we, what we made, greed took over and forgot that I was the founder and the guy with the idea. <laughs> so <laughs> with all his connections and the last name behind him, he went and hired the one of the best litigators in Los Angeles to sue me uh -huh. um, in an effort to avoid paying me. So um, paying me my fair share. So long story short, three years of brutal litigation. Uh, we went to a jury trial. He would not settle. Uh, we went to a jury trial and we won 12 to zero. You know, every single member of the jury agreed with me, um, got my money back, but it cost me, it cost me, you know, 40% of whatever I made in, in attorney's fees. So that was not fun. So <laughs> <laughs> lesson learned, choose your partners carefully. Yeah. I don't wow. care who they are, what the last name is, choose your partners carefully. And, um, and second lesson is don't be afraid of fighting somebody that has not more money, but more resources. Uh, in this case, he had a litigator that was doing, he was working for him on a pro bono basis. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. so how was, uh, that's brutal. What a story <laughs> that it, it was three years of litigation all the way to just have, um, he wouldn't settle as wild to me, um, knowing that it was like a, yeah, just somebody that was taking advantage and clearly you had founded it and that's that's wild uh so when it came to the like valuation when, when that the high net worth from chicago came in were, was there like did you guys shop it around at all or was the person that came in just bought in they had an email address they were a user where did how did that start yeah they were a user they were friends with um with the whole Reagan family, and um, and they just absolutely love President Reagan, everything that had to do with Reagan, and they saw the value of the data. They saw the value of having, um, you know, loyal fans of Ronald Reagan and and the massive email um, database that you can communicate with. Yeah, um, yeah. that we would not, we did not shop it around, and that was another uh, another mistake. Um, but it was so attractive, you know, we. We weren't making that much money and never thought that the valuation was that that high. Yeah, yeah. And when it came to the team size, was it just the two of you? How, how big did the team get? You're looking at a team. <laughs> just, the, just the team. Wow. Steve, wow. was very easy. Well, the customer service was a little hard because we would get, you know, the 65-year-old guy from Alabama who was running a Windows 98 computer and didn't know what email was. So that was a little bit hard. Um, but, you know, at that time, uh, Team Viewer came to life and I was uh, supporting them on Team Viewer and telling them how to use their email address. It, it's funny because uh, I think 60% of our customers never use the email. They just secure their email address. Wow. Wow. Sorry. Huh. Interesting. So when it came to the, the, the deal, uh, was there any sort of like earnout or vesting period or what, what did that look like? Was it just cash at evaluation and then you guys went your separate ways? No, we got stock. We had shares in the new com in the new company. Um, okay. There was no cash uh, value on, on the transaction. So he, um, guy in Chicago, formed a new entity, brought this in, invested $2 million to hire Rush Limbo to be our spokesperson. Mm -hmm. And um, and then just grew to, I I think the last time I checked, they had 300,000 users. So, okay. Not wow. Bad. So interesting. So it was like at evaluation, they purchased it and, um, yeah, interesting. So when it came to negotiations, was it just, uh, you going back and forth with the buyer or was it the guy, Michael involved? How did that work? <laughs> I told you at the beginning, Michael was not the sharpest guy in the, in, in the, in the room. Um, he did all the negotiations. Huh. Uh, I I was not privileged to the negotiation. So yeah, I, I, again, 
finding the right partner, somebody that you can <laughs> trust and somebody yeah. that respects you and the, the, the respect is mutual, it's probably harder than finding a good wife, right? So uh, it, it is a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm not complaining. I made money. It was a fantastic run. I, I met a lot of good people. I learned a lot about emails. Um, and, uh, you know, it goes on my, uh, on my resume as, as a great success. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, like you said, under two years, uh, to, to exit is a pretty incredible, incredible run. So when it, after the transaction happened and everything like that, how long until you started up your next thing? Oh, it was immediate. Immediate. I started, uh, I, in parallel, while I was doing Reagan.com, I had my consulting firm. After I left Auto Trader, I became a high paid consultant to marketplaces. Yep. Mm -hmm. I am pretty good at sales. I am pretty good at e-commerce and uh, selling cars, selling anything online. Um, I, I, you know, it's not that I said it, but uh, somebody in Europe said that there are seven people at this level and one of them. Um, we can sell anything and we can structure and we can make money online. So I, I was consulting. I was consulting to really large companies and really small companies uh, all over the world. Europe and Eastern Europe were my biggest source of uh, customers because I had a non-compete for the first three years after I left out of trade, I had non-compete with them. So, so I had to go to Europe, but um, yeah, it was fun. I mean, I became a, a coach and a sales consultant and sales trainer and, uh, and also and, and a consultant to, to marketplaces, telling them how to hire people, how to incentivize their sales reps and how to structure their ad structure on the website. Nice. Very nice. And I guess taking a step back with the, the transaction, it was kind of a bumpy, <laughs> the bumpy three year sort of, uh, litigation window there, but for people listening, what could you share around, you know, I know you mentioned picking your partner correctly, which is a, a great piece of advice for anyone, uh, starting a business and it's extremely hard and high risk for sure. But when it came to timing, you know, why was it that, you know, what could you share in terms of why timing is so important and when the right time is to sell? What could, what kind of knowledge could you drop there? The timing is important, is, is extremely important, but more, more importantly, I think Stanford university calls this design thinking, find out what people are looking for, what people are willing to pay for, and then design a product to fulfill that. Your ideas are fantastic. You know, everybody has a million ideas. Everybody hits me with NDAs. I have a great idea. Sign this NDA. Um, I'm, I, I, I never do that. Um, identifying the group of people that need your services, your products, and then creating a product for them. We identify, and by the way, this, this is a still a, an absolute untapped market. We identified people over 65 years old that live primarily in the South and the deep South of the United States that nobody cares about, you know, you, um, really no nobody cares about that's why it's very easy for politicians to flip their their vote that's very easy to for us to sell them a product or a service because nobody's talking to them you you see it on 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 marketing um, schools or channels or videos or what have you they're targeting the x generation and the youth is like fine you can do that everybody's doing that one they have no money two they have no idea what they want three um there is a better better market right um it's there, there is a there is a, a segment of the population that nobody is really reaching for except health insurance companies and medicare and uh, uh you know lawyers telling them to sue whoever but um <laughs> that's about it <laughs> <laughs> got it yeah timing is definitely always a a key a key question um that i that i get so i think taking taking the next step I, i'd love to talk about you know, all of, all of the learnings that you had, obviously you've shared a big one here that I think will probably be the headline of this episode of picking your partners <laughs> carefully and making sure that you're, you're, you know, organized with, with all of your business matters. So you don't go through like three year litigation. It's such a valuable lesson. And I'm glad that you can look back on it and say like, yeah, that was lesson learned and you took it in stride and you're currently building a business. But before we get to what you're working on now, knowing what you know now, what would you tell Elias 10 years ago? Spend $80 on a deep background check on your partners. A because during background. litigation, uh, besides Michael Reagan, there was another clown that 
came into the picture who claimed to be a billionaire and a Republican guy um, who helped supposedly help Michael Reagan guide him through the process. And this guy had been in jail for two years for fraud. Whoa. You know how difficult it is to get caught and <laughs> actually get convicted of fraud and then sent to jail, to prison for two years for federal fraud? Well, I don't know what this guy did, but apparently he went to court and spunched his records. But during the litigation, we spent the $80 and found out who he was. And then we spent $80 and found out that Michael Reagan had been indicted of uh, federal crimes as well. So, you know, nowadays we talk about it's like doing business with Hunter Biden right today. Yeah, uh, they wow. use the family name to to commit crime. So I would say spend eighty dollars. Take it easy. Don't get excited about ideas. Uh, don't overthink it. Right. It, it, follow your gut feeling. Uh, follow your 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 free will. But take a little step and say, let's find out who this person really is. You know, yeah. it, it could be a simple search as to. You know, uh, Michael Smith, comma, scam or lawsuit or what have you. And you can you can you can find a lot of things or just spend eighty dollars on a deep background check. Yeah. Good good tip. Eighty dollars <laughs> on a background check. Very good yeah. tip. Well, cool. Uh, what are you building now and what can you tell us about it? So two things. I am a high paid consultant. I, I again I, I consult to to businesses that want to sell products online, mostly Amazon or um, you know, the other the other marketplaces, Latin America, Mercado Libre, uh, other ones in, in Europe. But I, I come with a unique perspective because I also have my own marketplaces. I have one very, very profitable and and, and, and good in Mexico called Progresando.com, translates to pro making progress, Progresando.com, and one in the U.S., Uber.com. And Uber.com is a test, beautiful platform where we sell products that Amazon doesn't want or I had, or are restricted or have low profit margins. So I can, you know, in my consultant firm, I can coach you how to do X or how to sell online. By the way, I'm doing that. So I, I kind of have a better understanding. You, you've dealt with consultants that tell you what to do, but they've never done it. No, I'm currently doing what I tell people how to do. So nice. that's what I'm working on. Nice. How do you find the, the products that Amazon won't sell? Is there like a database that's updated where you can like reach out to those companies and put them on... A list them on, on your marketplace? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, the categories that they are very restricted, of course, during the pandemic, um, uh, categories that Amazon took over, it's not that they are restricted, they just want to control and they don't want anybody else, like the mask, anything that had to do with uh, personal protection items. Right now we're dealing with anything that are accessories for hunting or fishing or uh, guns and firearms, right? Not right. that we're selling firearms, not that we're selling guns, but we're selling the accessories for the hunters. Um, like the red eyes, the scopes, the globes, the whatever, uh, personal protection, uh, the pepper sprays. Those are the categories that are restricted. And then we go after the categories that have very little profit margin that are trying, you know, U.S. based, U.S. manufactured products that are trying to compete with China. And if they don't have a 70, 60, 70 percent profit margin, they're not successful on Amazon, but they are with us because our rates are very low. Got it. Very cool model. I like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Kind of helping, helping people that can't can't sell through Amazon. That's very cool. Well, where can people learn more about the the platforms? Uber.com, y o o v e r dot com. Um, uh, my resume is there. My contact information is there. Um, Uber.com slash my first name Elias Shavando. Um, they, they can contact us there. They can start their own store. They can start selling. Everybody's selling. We have about 120,000 products on both platforms together. Uh, the idea is to have a cross-border platform where you can buy products from Mexico and get them shipped to your to your house or, or, ha or find a manufacturer in Mexico instead of doing China, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Well, those are all the questions that I have for you wherever you guys are listening on iTunes, or Spotify, the links that Elias mentioned will be in the show notes, but thank you so much for coming on and sharing uh, this kind of wild story here. <laughs> Success comes at a price, you know, it's not as easy as uh, you always read the headlines, right? Um, company X sold for X millions of dollars, but at the end of the day, the entrepreneur is uh, not sometimes very well compensated. You know, the venture capital guys, they take their, their exit and, um, uh, and the shysters also 
<laughs> <Major problem. laughs> yeah, but it's all good. You know, we just have to keep going and learning from our mistakes and not doing them again. Uh, now, Steve, I have to confess, I'm very picky right now who I do business with. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, people ask me, it's like, why didn't you close that deal? I just couldn't trust the guy. <laughs> why didn't you pick up that client? I just couldn't trust the guy. You know? <laughs> Well, yeah, lesson learned. And now you have the, the ability to pick and choose who you work with, which is great. That's an empowering, empowering thing to have. So that's all the questions I have. But thanks again for coming on. Thank you very much, Steve. Great being with you.